welcome again to one of our family meetings because this is like a kind of family. The family is called Cuerda Piel. Uh, Cuerda Piel is uh, made up of um, nine dermatopathologists and two dermatologists. Uh, you already know Rodrigo Restrepo, Jamile Corredoira, Enrique Loaiza, Juan Carlos Garcés, Gonzalo de Toro, Gabriel Casas, Maru Macei, Elizabeth Ball, um, Isabel Casas, Monse Molgo, and myself. And we've been doing this for a while, I think since uh, the pandemic started. And we've been inviting people from Mexico and from Latin America. And now uh, was the time to invite uh, my, my dearest professor, Dr. Philip McKee. Uh, when I started at the Brigham uh, in 2000, I was pregnant. I was a very big uh, woman with a very big belly. And I always said, you know, Dr. Philip McKee until the, I think the third time I said, Dr. Philip McKee, uh, he said, I'm not Dr. Philip McKee, I'm just Philip. So since that time, he's been more than a professor. He's been my friend, he's been tolerant with me. And you already know much of his biography. I was going to tell you a little bit of that, but I think you can read it in LinkedIn. And uh, what I'm gonna say is that he's more than you can see. He's um, such a kind man, uh, such a wonderful person. He is um, one, a person that gets so excited about dermatopathology, about photography, about clinical pictures that you can get, you know, um, uh, you know, cover all with his passion. And, um, and that's the way I learned dermatopathology. When I arrived at the Brigham, I thought I knew something, but I realized I didn't know anything. And uh, he showed me, he showed me the way, he showed me how to think. And I, I'm just very grateful that he's with us and he's having the time to, to, uh, to share his knowledge with us. And also I'm, Grateful that Antonina is here and Ivan also, which are very close friends of Philippe and, he, and they're being very nice. And you already know his Facebook page that uh, it's around 16,000 people right now. They're sharing 40 cases every day. It's almost very difficult to follow them, but we're learning from everyone. Um, dear Philippe, you're very more than welcome here in Cuerda Piel in Latin America and especially in Mexico. So um, with a very good cock as a virtual thing, uh, please, um, you can start. Okay, well, thank you so much, Marcella, for those extremely kind words. And, and yes, indeed, we do go back a very, very long time and we've developed a very warm and close friendship and yes, I, I remember very well when you first appeared in, 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 in Brigham. In, in fact, it was a rather remarkable sight because uh, I was looking down the corridor and, and, and round the corner came this huge abdomen. And, and I had no idea what was on the other side of it because it preceded Marcel about at least half a second. And it was quite a sight, and uh, um, we we uh, we had to look after her quite carefully because she wasn't too she wasn't too far off um, the sort of delivery date, and I used to worry a lot about her in case, just in case she, she'd have she'd decide to have the baby in the middle of sign out, <laughs> because I I. I uh, um, I always thought that having babies is, is, I know this is probably not politically correct, but for me it was always a, a thing that ladies do and, and men are best to spend their day in the bar and, and come along with roses after the baby's been born. But nowadays it seems everybody, including the kitchen sink, seems to be present at a, at a birthing occasion. Now, um, Marcella summed me up not rather nicely. You know, I, uh, even to this day, and I'm 72 now, I get just as excited today as I did when I started dermatopathology in 1972. So I've been doing it for 48 years. 
and I love it every bit as much now as I did then. And one of the beautiful things about the speciality is it's so complex and it's so difficult and one needs clinical pathological correlation all of the time for everything that um, nobody knows everything. I certainly don't. I, I, I make no bones about the fact that I learn stuff every day. It's quite humbling when you see a case on Makedom and you realize you've never heard of it. And of course, I can't say that because I have to I have to appear godlike, and so I, I just may, don't make a comment and hope that nobody notices. Now, um, this presentation is, it's got to be very um, uh, two-way. It's got to be interactive, otherwise I'll get bored. And so I've put together a whole lot of cases, and we'll see how many we can get through. And... Um, what I'll what I'll do is I'll show you the show you the histology and then we can talk a little about a, a little bit about the case and then come to the diagnosis if there is one. But before I do that, I wanted to show you a a, a, um, a short little little grouping of cases that I came across yesterday. I, I was thinking that I needed to put these into the melanoma variance category and then I thought well maybe I'll show them to Marcella's group because they're really fascinating lesions and these are the combined epithelial and melanocytic tumors and I'll there is a group there are a group of them and I'll come to them in a moment this is just an image that I'm showing of one that I borrowed from Dr. Wong and, and co-authors from Dermatology Online, and it so happens it's a squamomanomacytic tumor, but we'll come back to that in a moment. Um, so this is, this is the histology of their case. And um, what I find about this tumor is it, it can be very difficult to recognize because sometimes they're not so heavily pigmented. And so you'll see the squamous epithelium and then you see a rather basaloid cell population, which in this case is heavily pigmented and very dendritic. And so it's a bit, it's fairly obvious, but that isn't always the case. And when you do the immunohistochemistry, um, you can obviously pick up the, the squamous bit quite easily. And um, the melanocytic component is sometimes as much more than you actually realized. Um, this, th 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 this is SOX10 on the bottom right. And uh, there are far more cells, m melanocytes, than I had appreciated on the H&E. So, that brings me to a, um, a publication that was in the, um, the JAD in 2015, which I, I put the, the summary on the right-hand side because it's, it's the most up-to-date collection of cases that, are, that had been published by 2015. And... and um, it, they had some 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 interesting observations. Um, they 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 in the combined study they had eleven squamomelanocytic tumors, three basomelanocytic, and two trichoblastomelanocytic tumors. Now I've not seen a a a a, a blastomy comatose uh, or uh, melanocytic tumor, but perhaps one or two of you had, and you can mention that when we get to the end of, of this section. Um, what I think is most interesting is that when you look at the melanocytic bit, you think it's melanoma, because it, it's mitotically active, it can be pleomorphic, the big nuclear line. Everything you look at says, gosh, this looks like a melanoma, and you sort of almost forget that there's the squamousy bit or the 
BCC like bit. But other than one case that Laurie Erickson published of a basomelanocytic tumor, they don't seem to do anything at all, which is, which is uh, well, it's obviously terribly important from the patient's point of view. And, and if you recognize this entity and don't call it a melanoma, well then, so much the better. So this is the first squamomelanocytic tumor that I ever saw that Steve Poole, at the time he was on the, the, the Harvard Medical School Dermatopathology group. And uh, I haven't got any other images, I'm afraid, but you can see that there's a, a very worrisome looking infiltrate of, of cells with hyperchromatic very irregular nuclei. Some of them there are prominent nucleoli. And over here, there's a, a keratin pearl. But I'd be very hard pushed to know quite what that was on the H&E. But on the bottom right, you can see there's an awful lot of squamous epithelium. I think this is the AE1, AE3. And then on the top right, there's S100 protein. So um, that, that was my first, the first case that I ever saw. And then um, this is, a, th th this is um, the case that Laurie uh, Erickson posted. She, she very kindly share, shared it with me. And this was a male age 56 with a scalp tumor which at first sight you might think, well, maybe it's a BCC, it's got nice peripheral palisading, although this is obviously an artifact, this splitting off, uh, and I think that's an artifact too. So although it was vaguely BCC-ish, it didn't really quite fit, fit that, those criteria. And there are some more views uh, you can see the sun damaged skin, which which uh, is is a constant feature of the tumors, and um, it all looks a bit undifferentiated. And on the H and E, um, I don't, you know, I have to be really honest. It's embarrassing, I suppose, but I'd never have thought of there being melanocytes there in the first place. I'd have been shoving myself towards BCC or something like that. But there's the immunohistochemistry. And I thought this was so surprising that, that, that there is an epithelial component, but it's mostly uh, melanocytic. There's HMB45 and tyrosinase. Uh, and um, the patient went on to develop lymph node and lung metastases. Now, this, I suppose it begs the question, as this is the only one that actually did anything, is this really uh, a basomelanocytic tumor, or is it actually colonization of some appendage tumor by melanoma? Because if that was the case, then that would explain why it metastasized. So I have a, a feeling in the back of my mind that we're being misled by this keratin and this is actually a, 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 a collision tumor, if you like, and this is actually really melanoma. But that's, uh, I can't prove that. And then I've got this case. This, this is a super case that Michael Lee from New Orleans shared with us on the key dome. And I thought, wow, when I looked at it at low power, I thought, well, this, this looks like, looks like a keratoacanthoma. And if it's not a keratoacanthoma, perhaps it's a, um, a follicular or infundibulocystic squamous carcinoma. I thought it was one or the other. And um, when you look at it at higher power, you can see all the squamous proliferation, but that, then there's this tumor here, which is, which is quite different. And let's look at that in, in closer magnification. There, there's, the, uh, there's the squamous element, and there's squamous element there. Uh, the other thing that it maybe made, made me think of was, well, are we being fooled by a melanoma that's showing 
pseudo epithelium which is hyperplasia because you can get that was if i go back one why why does it look like a ka i, I can't really fit um pseudo epithelium which is hyperplasia into that silhouette so um well, i'm a bit stuck on that one uh, but anyway when we look at the high power this is a horrible looking tumor, although that, that looks, well, I don't know whether that's a keratin pearl or not, but it looks very unpleasant. Lots and lots of melanin pigment. And when we go across, there's the, there, there's the squamous epithelium. And I suppose, well, I don't know it, it, it. It's hard to know what to make of it really, but there's the immunohistochemistry. This is, um, SOX10, and I think that's S100 protein, but unfortunately that one wasn't labeled, so I'm only guessing that. So here we have um, another example. Is it a squamomelanocytic tumor, or is it, is it a keratoacanthoma that's got uh, uh, seeded by melanoma? I don't really know the answer to it, and we don't have the follow-up. So I, I'll be interested to hear what any of you guys think, because it's, it's, it is perplexing. And then this was the first basomelanocytic tumor that I ever saw, which was shared with me by Professor Wayne Grayson, who is another of my very old friends. He's from the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. And he shares my, my love of, of fast cars. And I have to share this story with you. It's got nothing to do with the matter of pathology, but when we were living in, in Arizona, I had this Ferrari. It was a 600 horsepower car. And would you like to drive it? And he, he was very nervous, but he said, okay. And so he was driving along very cautiously, thank God. And we came to traffic lights, which was a crossroads. And he turned left, which is what I told him to do, but he forgot that he was in America and we were aiming straight for all the, the cars at the traffic lights. So I had to yank on the handbrake to stop the car and Wayne had to get out very embarrassed. And that was the last I let him use, uh, let him drive of the Ferrari, but it was, a, it was quite an experience. So this is the case he shared with me. And it's a, it's a basaloid tumor, whether it's a VCC or not is a, a separate question, although it probably is. It looks as if there is a real retraction artifact. There is palisading. And then the tumor, or the, the basaloid population is riddled with, um, with a second population of cells, which you see in high power at the bottom right. And there, there is a close-up view there. And the, these cells don't look very nice. They are very hypochromatic. They were full of mitotic figures. And there on the top right, there's the AE1 showing us the keratin component. And at the bottom, there's uh, uh, melanin and uh, microthalmia transcription factor. So we're picking up there's a, there's a lot more melanocytic component. It's very dendritic. Uh, I don't have any follow-up for that patient, but I thought that was a good example of a basomelanocytic tumor. I, I, I think they're best called tumor rather than implying any biological behavior. Otherwise, you get into a real model. And so that's... That's the end of that little section. And with that, I, I'm hoping that we'll get some interesting comments or questions from Marcella and from the audience. I uh, just ask if anyone has gotten any experience with this entity and most of them have said no, uh, except Antonina that she had a case, uh, she said she's a strange tumor. And Maru Masei, she's from Uruguay, and she's part of Cuerda Piel, and she has seen pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia in a melanoma that clinical resemble a seborrheic keratosis, which is scary. 
Well, I have also seen several rare keratosis like lesions, but not exactly uh, these entities. Um, mm -hmm. uh, no, uh, Robledo from um, Brazil, Robledo Rocha, uh, he said maybe he has failed from them, but he hasn't seen any either. Yeah, um, I've seen I've I've seen quite a number of of uh, melanomas with with pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia. Uh, and looking very like a seborrheic keratosis on top. But I, I thought that keratoacanthoma growth pattern was really very striking, and I, I couldn't match that up with, pseudo, with, 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 um, with a reactive hyperplasia. I really did think that was telling us something, but uh, I don't know what, and unfortunately I don't have follow-up. Okay, well now, now, now it's quiz time. So <clears throat> this is the first case, and Marcella will probably recognize this one instantly because she's got a great memory and she, she looked at all of my cases. She actually relabeled the ones that I'd made the wrong diagnosis on, which was very helpful and uh, all of the things out. So this was an elderly patient with a nodule on the cheek. And you can see that there's a uh, that there's a tumor present, and it's composed of basaloid cells, and it looks as if there's necrosis there. And we look a bit closer, you can see these um, nests of cells uh, with some squamous differentiation. That, that there you can see a little bit there, and we'll look at that in higher power here. And there you can see the, the um, basaloid cells, and they're, they're, they're fairly pleomorphic. Mitoses were easy to find, and there's one in the center of the field there. And then when we looked, uh, when we looked that, that, there's another mitosis there. The other thing that one can appreciate now, one's beginning to see that there's a second population of cells uh, with very beautiful dendritic processes. So these have got to be melanocytes. And so I suppose, having just looked at the last series of cases, perhaps some of you might be thinking, are we looking at a, uh, another basomelanocytic tumor? And, and that's a jolly good thought if you are. Um, oh gosh, there's another field I'd that, there's another mitosis. I obviously got carried, and there's one there. So there are mitoses all over the place. And uh, here's, here, now here things are changing, aren't they? Because we're getting, we're getting keratinization, but it's a very orange color, isn't it? It's not the bright red that you expect to see in, um, in fundibular keratinization. And there you're getting, the impression perhaps of ghost cells, at least I, I think that would be my interpretation. There's a little bit of necrosis. You can see some nuclear dust in the middle. I'm sure you remember this case well, Marcella. So here we are, there's my final picture. So do, does anybody want to give me their opinion on this case other than Marcella? Uh, let's give them uh, two seconds so that they can write something in the chat. Yes, absolutely. Uh, ca ca can they, they can't join by speaking, no? Uh, they can do that also. Can they do a video link? That would be great if they could. Yeah, if they, if you, yes. If you want to make a comment, it's, it's okay. You just have to turn on your microphone. Uh, I'd like it if, if we could see each other because then it makes it more interactive. I suppose you'd all get nervous, but you mustn't be nervous with me. I am probably the kindest dermatopathologist in the whole world. <laughs> Isn't that true, Marcella? It's completely true. <laughs> well, I can be actually. Yeah. I can be. I can be awful. There are aspects. <laughs> I think I have. Me I, I I think I've mellowed a lot. These Gracie tells me I'm. I've mellowed, but I used to have a ferocious temper as Marcella, I think, if she thinks back, she can probably remember the odd occasion when I, when I let fly. But 
my bark is worse than my bite. So do we have any suggestions? So yes, uh, they've been saying palometric carcinoma, pigmented onico trichocarcinoma, melanocytic palometric carcinoma, palometric carcinoma, I guess, uh, uh, malignant pigmented palometric coma. So they're going into the palometrics pigmented thing. Okay, well, that's malignant. They're all thinking it's malignant. Okay. Well, now here's the thing. This this was the first melanocytic matricoma that I ever saw. And I can understand, whoops, um, hang on, I just go back. I can understand why you're all thinking it's malignant because they all look malignant. Um, now, I've forgotten when this was first described, but it was within the last two decades anyway. And I borrowed this picture uh, from Actoderma to all because it's such a beautiful image. And for those of you who are dermatologists, that's the dermoscopy. And I thought, wow, that's almost like a, it's almost like a beautiful abstract painting. I mean, I don't, I, I, I wouldn't want to comment on it myself, other than that one can see there is some melanin pigment, and then there's this multi-nodular basaloid thing in the middle. So, this is a tumor that um, you get in the elderly. Um, there's a predilection, a predilection for males. And there's one report where a patient presented with a whole bunch of them. And biologically, they're benign. They do look awful, but their biological behavior is, is uh, quite benign. And um, I'll show you an, uh, another case or two, I think. There are... I can't remember how many. There are maybe one or two recurrences in the whole of the literature that I could find, but there have been no, no metastases in these at all. Uh, and whether this helps, um, they're beta-catenin positive, but I, I'm not sure that's going to be terribly helpful. And this is, this is, an, this is another one. Gosh, my... My mouse is getting carried away here. This is another one that Wayne Grayson shared with me, and it looks just pretty much the same. Um, these great big um, islands of tumor in the dermis, and even at this sort of times, oh, times four magnification or times 10, you can pick out there are dendritic processes all over the place. And on the bottom left, you can see the melanocytic component. And on the bottom right, you see there are two mitoses right side by side. And the basaloid cells are quite, well, they're quite pleomorphic. They've got great big nucleoli. So everything about that says it should be a, it should be malignant, but it's not, it's quite benign. And there's the, there's the, this is very obviously a pyrometric or it's obviously a matricial tumor. And on the left, um, it looks more like a melanoma. And then when we look at the next picture, here's the immunohistochemistry. There, there's the, uh, the squamous component, uh, and there's the HMB45 and the S100. So those, those are typical melanocytic matricomas, and it's important that, that you recognize that for what it is. Otherwise, you'll be asking for re-excisions and heaven knows what. And as I say, they're quite benign. And here's, an, here's another one. Now this one is a bit different and I'm not sure, I'm not sure about this because this, there's a lovely lady, Joanna Baron Moore from, she's from Santa Maria in California. And she shared this case with me, which is a great big ulcerated nodule on the, the leg which histologically looks like a melanocytic matricoma, but I don't know whether it is or it isn't, and we don't have follow-up. So I'm showing you this one to see what you guys think. 
So on the low power, we can see the, the carotenized squamous epithelium, and then there's a background um, basaloid population. And on the bottom right, it looks matricial, just like the other ones. Uh, but when we look at higher power, you can see there's, there's tumor necrosis. There's a peripheral palisade here, which is quite striking. Uh, which reminded me a bit of, um, of BCC and also reminded me of the, um, the uh, basal melanocytic tumor that we looked at at the very start. But then there's clearly there is matricial differentiation and ghost cells. But then we got this population on the top right that is showing frank necrosis and it's got this um, trabecular growth pattern, uh, which, gosh, I mean, perhaps this is, perhaps we're looking at a, a trichoblastomatous tumor colonized by melanocytic tumor of some sort that's also showing uh, uh, matricial differentiation. It, to my mind, it's a very complex tumor. Uh, and you can sort of go in different directions depending upon which field you focus on. So there's the immunohistochemistry. There, sorry, on the bottom, top left, it, uh, those, there are the basaloid cell, there are the ghost cells. On the bottom right, there's a high power showing there are two mitoses there and there are the dendritic cells. And this is on the top right is the uh, S100. So there's a lot of there's a lot more melanocytic component than one really anticipated from the H and E, and there's a close-up view there. So um, I'm not sure what this is. We 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 ended up thinking it fitted best with melanocytic matricoma, but the more I look at it, the more my mind wanders. Is this a, a more complex follicular tumor? that is showing trichoblastomatous and matricial differentiation. Perhaps it's not benign at all. Perhaps we're being misled. And it's got this melanocytic component. And uh, that's as far as I go with that. So I'm going to go on. Oh, I, I put this in just for a differential diagnosis. Um, Someone's got their microphone on, which they should turn off, please. Thanks. Um, I just, I, I, I found these four images. I used to have a lot of matricial carcinomas, but I, I've, I've lost most of them. And the important difference, of course, is you don't get any colonization by any melanocytes. And... Um, uh, um, so you, you, you have the basaloid cells, loads of mitosis, and there's the key 67. So it's, it, it's a different tumor. Now, uh, I'll go on to the next, which is now um, a couple of beautiful lions. Does anybody want to make any comments about matricial matricoma, including Marcella? Um, there's no comment uh, for me. Um, I, I just remember the ones that I saw in your collection. I haven't recognized them since then. So, um, no, I, so they, yeah, I think they're desperately rare. Yes. Desperately rare. But the important thing is the take home message from all of what I've shown you now is that basal squamous, uh, basal melanocytic, squamomelanocytic, trichoblastomelanocytic, and um, melanocytic matricoma, those, are, those four entities all look malignant, and they're all benign, with one exception, uh, and that's the basomelanocytic that Laurie 
uh, Ericsson posted, and I have raised the query that perhaps that that diagnosis might be changed in the light of the knowledge we have now, but I'm not sure. Okay, so that's, now we're coming, we're, we're going away from curiosities. This is a case that I want your help with. And this is a case that another of my great friends, Antony Nikolmakova, shared with me. Now, as I've mentioned on Makedam, Antony Nikolmakova, she is my lifesaver uh, in terms of cases because she shares everything with me. And I'm going to tell you a funny story. I sent her a message yesterday and I said that I was so grateful to her for sharing so many cases because most of my presentations are completely with cases from her, her um, scanner. So she sent me a message back saying, oh, think nothing of it. The way I look at it is you're the Formula One driver and I, that is Antonina, changes the tires. So I responded to her and I said, don't forget that if you don't change the tires properly, it costs you three or four seconds, which is easily enough to lose a race in, in, in Formula One. So uh, uh, any, anyway, I just want to credit Antonina and CSD Healthcare because they are so kind to me and I'm really appreciative. Now look, this is a case that has caused me so much grief and Antonina has caused her grief too and we're hoping that you guys are going to tell us what's going on. So this is an elderly lady. Oh, the other thing I wanted to make the comment to you is, you see how, how fantastic it is to have a scanner. And what I'm going to tell you all is, if you have to mortgage your house or sell your wife or your husband, then you need to do that so that you can get yourself a scanner because it transforms sharing cases it's so it is i mean look at the look at the resolution this is this is just mind-blowing you'll never get that with photographing with your camera so you need to get a scanner so there we are so it's a lesion on the foot and you can tell it's the foot because it's got a great thick keratin layer and um, well, it could be the, the palm of the hand too, because if, if you want to tell the difference between the palm of the hand and the sole of the foot, you look for big, big thick wall lymphatic trunks, which are very conspicuous on the sole of the foot, but we haven't got any here. But anyway, we've got this tumor, and the next slide will show us that in more detail there is the top of the tumor and there's the squamous epithelium now it's very ulcerated and we could not identify a definitive origin of the tumor but it does look to me as if if you got five microns in that tumor would probably be arising from the epidermis. And so on that magnification, I was thinking this is going to be some sort of poroma. And then um, that's, uh, oh, that's just a closer view. You see, if you look there, you can almost, it's almost touching. So uh, that's, that, that's certainly, and you, you get the impression here that the, tumor is going up to the epidermis and that that's a little bit pleomorphic so you might wonder perhaps uh, could this be a a, a porocarcinoma that that would be something that would come to my mind and then when we go to the rest of the tumor it looks different um this is this then becomes a clear cell tumor with um, a peripheral palisade of, of um, cells with pinkish or slightly amphophilic cytoplasm. And this bit looks more like a, a clear cell hydradenoma to me. 
And there are some more views showing, um, well, they all show the same thing at different magnifications. And there's a mitosis in the bottom right, and there's a, 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 a pleomorphic nucleus that Antonina marked there. Um, but what I would say uh, is remember tumors grow, and so a mitotic figure does not make a tumor malignant. It just tells you that it's getting bigger. It doesn't make it a carcinoma. And uh, here's another view. Um, there's this bit here that's, that's um, a little bit more pleomorphic, and there is a, a mitosis there, and there's a, a, a slightly more pleomorphic bit there. And here we see ductal differentiation with a nice lumen with a well-developed cuticle around it. And then let's see what else we've got. Uh, so, what's everyone's opinion on this case now? So, everyone has to think about it, and, um, well, we can, um, I, it used to be I would tell a joke while you thought, but I think we don't want to waste too much time. Uh, uh, Marcella, what, what, what do you think of this so far? I would go with a poroma, porocarcinoma, as you said, since the, well, not the first picture, but the second that you showed, I was thinking of a poroma or porocarcinoma, and two or one mitosis um, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't drive me to malignant, but the growth pattern, I would pay a lot of attention, and um, the ulceration might be just of the tumor growth, but I would also consider it to, uh, for malignant. I don't have any comments right now in the chat, so... Um, well, you've, you've, actually, can, yeah. you've actually said a lot. Now, um, I've forgotten what my... Yeah, oh, yes. I'll tell you where, where we were. Um, we were very ambivalent about calling this malignant. We did, we did notice the top, but what the thing that struck us was any, was any, any atypia seemed to be underneath the ulcerated bit. So we weren't really sure whether that was in a sort of inflammatory atypia rather than uh, necessarily malignant. And if I go back a picture, um, I'll go back one more. This, this was the sort of feel that to us, uh, to me, I, I was thinking this looks more like a hydradenoma or else it's a clear cell poroma. But I couldn't get myself, I just was not comfortable calling it malignant. And then you see, this is where the trouble starts. So there's when I asked you for your opinion. Now, this is, this is the problem, you see. This is the actual slide on the scanner. And the patient, the surgeon submitted two bits of tissue. And this is the, the foot lesion. And this is, the, uh, this is an inguinal lymph node. And when I started looking at the case, what happened was... I, that's what I saw. I didn't see the foot thing at all. I just saw this and I thought, wow, that's a, that's a strange looking tumor. And there are lymphoid follicles. So I was pretty happy that this was a lymph node. All right. And then I looked at it more closely. And again, I thought this looks like a hydradenoma. Uh, and there it is in I, I, um, hang on, let, let me go back. I looked at this and I thought, well, I mean, the nuclei all look the same. Nuclei, they're not very obvious. There were very few mitoses in this. I had to hunt for ages to find one. And what I did find was there is a nice bit of ductal differentiation with the well-developed cuticle. So, um, so I saw this first, you see, and I thought, gosh, I don't, I, I, I'm having real problems. And then I looked at the whole slide and I found the foot, which of course helps you a lot. 
So we have some comments, Philip. <clears throat> okay, let, let's let's uh, hear the comments. So Gonzalo de Toro from uh, Chile, he says, uh, clear cell plus dark and squamatization may be a hadradenoma. Uh, from uh, San Luis Potosí, they say hadradenocarcinoma. Barbara Sainz from Monterrey, she says hydradenocarcinoma. Gabriel Casas from Argentina, he says no necrosis, mitosis under needle serration in acral site. He says hydradenoma, acrospiroma, poroma, traumatized, difficult case. Uh, Aide Caro from Mexico, from the uh, Institute of uh, Cancer, she says hydradenocarcinoma. I have seen, I, I think, a lecture from uh, Eduardo Calonje that he talks about the atypical hydradenomas and the hydradenomas adenocarcinomas and something like that. Yes, well, you, that's exactly, that's exactly what we're coming to. You see, um, that was, that was our, our final, our final thought was well-differentiated hydro, hydradenocarcinoma versus benign metastasizing hydradenoma, which is atypical hydradenoma with lymph node involvement which apparently doesn't do anything more than that it just that that's it, it it's rather like bap one inactivated spitz tumor that involves the, the lymph nodes and doesn't extend any further and it's not of it's not just of academic importance that's that's the problem with this case you see i i now some of you have said hydradenocarcinoma, and uh, I can't argue with that. I, I think that's a fair enough diagnosis. I couldn't get there, but that maybe is a reflection of me rather than the diagnosis. Um, I still, when I look at that tumor out of context, when I forget the clinical history and I ignore the lymph node, I have looked at that tumor for so long and it does not look like a, a, a conventional clear cell hydradenocarcinoma, which is always obvious. You know, you look at it and it's clearly a carcinoma and you might compare it. You might say, is this a hydradenocarcinoma? Is it a clear cell squamous carcinoma? Is it a metastatic clear cell carcinoma? They don't, in my experience, they don't look like this tumor. But um, maybe this is a new one for me. I'm perfectly willing to accept it. I, I make the point a lot that um, I am still learning. One learns all one's life. So, uh, you know, that's, that's a possibility. But the problem is, you see, if you call it well-differentiated hydradenocarcinoma, you can forget about the well-differentiated, really. Hydradenocarcinoma is one of the highest grade sweat gland tumors. If you have a sweat gland carcinoma, the two tumors you don't want to have are hydradenocarcinoma and apocrine carcinoma. Both of those are very bad news. And the chances of metastasis beyond lymph nodes to, to systemic involvement is quite high with a hydradenocarcinoma. Whereas if you call it benign metastasizing hydradenoma, then the implication is that it's not going to do anything more. And I don't have any more information on that one. I think we're going to have to wait. Unless, Mar uh, Antonina, can you bring in a comment now? Are you able to put your camera on so that we can see you? Gosh. I, I, don't, I don't see her. Uh, let me... Maybe she's had to leave because I, I know she, she has a big service commitment today. Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, well uh, if we ever get follow-up, uh, and I get information, I will be sure to let you know, Marcella, and then you can tell the group. Um, so uh, I don't have a clear-cut diagnosis for this case. I truthfully don't know whether that's a fully-fledged carcinoma or not. 
um, and I got stuck. So that's, that's, uh, that's a beautiful elephant. It's obviously gone, just gone for a dip in the local mud hole because it's nice and wet. Now, this is another one, you see. This is another of Antonina's cases. Uh, and this is not a difficult case, but it's a very, very beautiful case. And I have no clinical information whatsoever about where this tumor comes from. But um, there's a very thick subcutaneous fat. So um, I have a feeling the patient may have, have, have been sort of largish because of that. But I, I, that's as far as I can go. And you can see there's an ulcerated tumor. It's an exophytic tumor. And um, there is a, a closer view. And we can see it's another of these basaloid tumors that's necrotic and it's got clear cells scattered around the place and it's not a difficult diagnosis. And there we have high power views showing necrosis, showing clear cells, showing lots of mitoses and showing bubbly cytoplasm um, with uh, sebocyte differentiation. I'm not sure what the next picture shows. Ah, this is, uh, this is adipophilin, which is, isn't that beautiful? It's just so gorgeous. And then uh, this is MSH6, which shows loss of MH6 expression. And this is uh, PMS2, which is, which is normal. And there's MLH1, which is normal. And so I didn't put this in as a, as a quiz slide because it's, you know, I don't see there's anyone's going to have any difficulties. We and just I just have, wanted... Uh, Philip, we just have the information from Antonina. Maybe we can ask her again about the last... Oh, good, one. yes. So uh, she says, this one is a 60-year-old male in the leg. And if, uh, Antonina, if you're able to tell us about the previous case, the metastasizing hydroadenoma or hydroadenocarcinoma, if you can put on your microphone, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank Hi, you so Antonina. Nice to see you. For inviting me. I'm sorry, but I uh, had very um, bad problems with my internet. So I skipped last case. And if you have particular question, I will be happy to answer it. Oh. It was just to, to know if you remember that clear cell hydradenoma, hydradenocarcinoma that was present in the lady's lymph node. Did you yeah, get any I remember it. on her? Unfortunately, no, we don't have it. It was an uh, extra laboratory case. We had it for consultation and unfortunately I don't have any follow-ups. Okay, okay. Thank you. Well, um, I'll just carry on then. I just wanted to review um, sebaceous carcinoma because it's, it's a, a very important tumor, now, not only because it's, uh, the, the uh, recurrence rate is high, the metastatic potential is high, it's, it, it's a very bad tumor to have. Um, sorry, I, I don't know what happened there. Uh, so it's important that one recognizes it. Now, the, in the past, they've been separated into uh, periorbital and extraorbital tumors. And um, I, uh, biologically, uh, there's not really much sense in that because at either site, they're bad news tumors. But what is interesting is the Muratori syndrome seems to be only related to the non-ocular tumors rather than the, the periocular. So that is a, that's a significant difference. And so I put, I put this picture in. I haven't covered her eyes because this, this, is, a, this is the first sebaceous carcinoma I ever saw. And it's from about 1972, 73. And I saw the patient, and she was a lovely elderly lady, uh, and she had this tumor here. And I don't think for one minute she would care a tuppence whether you could see her face or not. And this is a nice example of a, 
of an ocular one uh, courtesy of Health Jade. And the point about the ocular ones is they're often misdiagnosed clinically as, as chalazian or blepharitis or a myobian cyst or a myobian abscess. And it can come as a nasty surprise to the dermatologist when they get the report of sebaceous carcinoma. And um, what do I want to say about this? Um, uh, well, they, they, they are very, very variable. They can present as a, as a big nodule, or more often they present as multiple nodules. And sometimes they're infiltrative and sometimes they aren't. So they can, and they can be very deceptive at low power. Uh, you can look at something and you think, gosh, this is um, a benign sebaceous tumor. Another thing that it's commonly mistaken for is um, trabecular trichoblastoma because sebaceous carcinoma can take on a trabecular growth pattern and, uh, or a ripple pattern. Uh, that's what I'm talking about there. So sometimes you can get caught out by that. So if you see a ripple pattern tumor, always check for sebaceous differentiation. And if you find sebaceous differentiation, start looking for mitoses. Mitoses don't matter in a trichoblastoma, but they matter an awful lot in in something that you think is going to be a sebaceous carcinoma. So be very careful there. Um, now, the, most, uh, most sebaceous carcinomas that are associated with Neurotory syndrome uh, have, this, have mutations in the, these mismatch repair genes, and that's inherited as an autosomal dominant, and mostly it's that lot. But then there's a second group that are autosomal recessive, and they can be associated with a variety of different mutations, of which TP53 is the most common. But this group is, is, is much smaller than the, the, uh, the more commonly encountered mismatch repair gene mutation associated tumors. You have a and question, I, Philip? Yeah. You have a question from Robledo Rocha. Uh, in your opinion, is it important to separate extraocular sebaceous carcinoma from the ocular type? Only, only because of Muratori syndrome. Otherwise, no. I, I, I mean, we always used to, and uh, I, I remember when I was writing the book, uh, in the second edition, I was following the literature religiously. And I was I divided them into ocular and extraocular, and then I wrote about the biological potential of the two, and it was the same, and the histology was the same. And I thought, why are we separating these out? It seemed a pointless exercise, um, except that uh, we then discovered uh, what used to be Tory Muir syndrome, but then we have to call it Muir Tory now. Um, and we discovered that those are, are only the extraocular, so that is important. Uh, so there's no point in, in doing immunohistochemistry for um, uh, uh, mismatch re repair mutations in a periocular, because you're wasting money because it's not associated, and that saves you a, a little bit of time now, I wanted to touch on Muratori syndrome because uh, it's desperately important. And one of the beauties of dermatology and dermatopathology is we can, we can point the clinician to something underlying that's much more important, perhaps necessary than the tumor itself. So for example, if you have a, a sebaceous adenoma or a sebaceoma, which is typically, which is obviously benign, you can worry about whether that is a, 
a marker for Muratori syndrome, and you can do the mismatch repair genes, and if, if you find one of them is absent, you know there's a mutation, so you can send the clinician off to check out, because you've got all of these tumors, particularly carcinoma of the colon, but they're all, all of these other ones. And then um, the other thing that's worth remembering is that it's not always in, it's not always inherited. You can get uh, Muratori syndrome in a sporadic setting, which seems to be related to ultraviolet light, uh, radiotherapy and uh, immunosuppression in particular with treatment with tacrolimus and cyclosporine. So that's something else that, that, you, that you need to uh, bear, uh, bear in the back of your mind. And as you know, these mismatch repair genes are important in correcting um, DNA replication area, so-called microsatellite instability. If one of these is mutated, you can't repair the gene properly, and hence uh, you're on the road to, uh, to developing cancer. Now, I just noticed it's five past four. You see, I could talk on forever, but you guys have got work to do, haven't you? So what time do you want me to stop at, Marcella? So uh, are you doing uh, maybe one more case if you want? I know well, what I'll do is I'll show you a few more pictures and then we'll get to the end. Okay. So um, I, um, I wanted to show you these two trimmers. These are our sebaceous adenomas in two different patients with Muratori syndrome. And this one is, is very characteristic because uh, they often get this wonderful colorette. And sometimes you can get a keratoacanthoma like tumor mixed up with sebaceous adenoma. And if you see that, you can be pretty sure the patient does have Muratori syndrome. Uh, and I just wanted to touch on the differential diagnosis. Um, uh, it's, 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 um, it's very important that, for example, you don't mistake sebaceoma, sebaceous adenoma for a sebaceous carcinoma. Now, there was this talk of well-differentiated sebaceous carcinoma that Bernie Ackerman used to talk about, and I, I found that a little bit confusing. And uh, it may be that I have misdiagnosed uh, sebaceous adenoma, or sebaceous carcinoma, uh, or sorry, I may have misdiagnosed an adenoma when it was actually a carcinoma, but I'm not aware of that. And it's important to remember all of these differential diagnoses here. And um, I just wanted to highlight sebaceoma because it's quite different from sebaceous carcinoma and from sebaceous adenoma. Adenoma presents as a single nodule. Sebaceous carcinoma can present as a single nodule or as multiple nodules, um, but it doesn't present in this superficial growth pattern where you're seeing clear and obvious origin from the overlying epidermis that looks quite bland. And the sebaceoma typically has large numbers of ducts and cyst-like spaces. Um, but it can have an awful lot of mitotic activity which can, can mis mislead you badly. Now, if you are thinking of BCC with, with sebaceous differentiation, which does happen, but it's incredibly rare, um, if you do bur EP4, it, it's um, negative in sebaceoma. So that was just that. And there's a nice view of sebaceoma there showing you lovely cysts. And uh, there's a great big duct there in, in the middle of the lesion. There's another duct there. I'm not sure whether I have them in high power or not. No, I just have the uh, sebaceous cells. And that's, that brings us to, to uh, I think that's probably a good place to stop, Marcella. 
And uh, as I've mentioned, I've got lots more cases, so it would be quite fun if you like. I can come back sometime if you can bear if you can bear another presentation from me. I I'd be very happy. And if anybody has any questions, um, ask away now. And if not, have a wonderful day, all of you. Make sure you keep your masks on and cover yourself with. Um, I was going to say insect repellent, but I didn't mean that. I meant virus repellent. And, and then on top of that, all of you be good. Okay, so, you, have, you have one question here before we, we end up this. Um, okay. uh, Ivan, Ivan or Ivan Pacheco, he says, does you, should be then sending all sebaceous lesions for MSI testing regardless of age. In Canada, we test all patients with colon cancer for MSI below age of 70. Um, I think with the exception of sebaceous hyperplasia and periocular sebaceous carcinoma, I think everything should be tested for mismatch repair gene mu mutations. Um, because you're going to, I mean, it's, the, muratory syndrome is rare, but this is such an important thing that we can do. We can, the patient can have early colonoscopy and can get all of the CT scanning they need done and to tr prevent them getting a cancer which kills them. So yes, I, I think um, I, that, that's always been, been my advice. And I'm sure it's good advice. I'm sure it is. So um, thank you very much, Philip. We do want a second part and a, maybe a third part or maybe a fourth part. Well, so, what uh, we'll do is you, <laughs> you and I can keep in contact yes, and we'll, yes. we'll make a date for August sometime. Yes, we will. Uh, so everyone is saying thank you. Congratulations for your presentation. It was delightful as, I, as we... Uh, as we knew, and um, I'm just asking everyone if you could turn on your video so um, Philip can stop sharing the the the, um, the screen and we can see each other because, as you know, Cuerda Piel and these meetings on Wednesday there are a family thing. It's not a this you know very serious thing. It's mostly a family thing where we share knowledge. How do I stop sharing my screen? Don't worry, I, I'll do it for you. Don't worry. Oh, I'll hang on, hang on. I, yeah, I, 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 I've got to come out of PowerPoint. Okay. That's the trick. Hang on, I'll just, um, I'll just, uh, gosh, there. No. Now, um, share a screen. Share a screen. Uh, no, we're gonna stop sharing the screen so we can see you in a big picture. Uh, let me. Oh gosh, aren't you oh, all yes. lovely? And hello, everybody. It's so nice to see you all. And there's everyone else. So um, this is just to say hello to 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 uh, feel that we're together. In, uh, Though we are very far away from each other, but we're together in this thing. We have people from um, also from the institute where I work. I know there's the chairman Armando Garamboa, which I'm very grateful that he joined, and a lot of people from Mexico and Latin America. As you see, Cuerda Piel is here. Jamile, Rodrigo, Gonzalo, um, yes, I, 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 I. Gabriel. And this is the family, and now Antonina, you can be part of our family. Well, I'm very <laughs> delighted. <laughs> Thank I'm you delighted. So, much. so, what you're telling me is, I've now, I've now got um, about ninety extra grandchildren, and I have to send them all birthday and Christmas presents. Yes, you have to. Yes. Oh you, gosh, that, what rich. a what a what a responsibility. Yes. Okay, well, have a lovely day and thank you so much. And I've enjoyed myself immensely. Just uh, wait a second. I'll take the yeah, I have there. there you are. And thank you so much, everyone, from, to, for being here again on a Wednesday. So I will we'll let you know when Philip McKee can join us again with Antonina and Ivan. And thank you very much, Cuerda Piel. Nice to see you, Antonina. Thank you, Antonina.
And um, thank oh. you all for being here. And um, take care. And as Philip said, uh, put your mask on. Okay, thank you very much. Bye-bye then. I'll try and get myself out of this now. Okay, thank you.